I are really excited to be here tonight to give you our perspective on uh, first what the problem was and then how we've used Cerebell to solve that problem. And hopefully by the end, we can give you a little bit on the clinical and financial implications of that, of the, of the implementation of Cerebell. So to start, um, I'm really pleased to be with Dr. Rincon. Dr. Rincon is a neurologist who trained, uh, did his critical care fellowship at Cooper, and then from there went on to Jefferson. And we've been lucky to have him come back to start and be the director of our first neurocritical care ICU. Um, I, on the other hand, I'm a, I'm a medical trained doctor. I did a fellowship in pulmonary critical care in Montefiore in the, in the Bronx. And since then have been at Cooper, where I, I primarily, tr I, I only practice as, a, as an intensivist. Um, one of my jobs is I am a site director and medical ICU doctor in a community hospital that Cooper provides critical care services to. Um, and you'll hear us talk about it throughout this presentation. Um, Inspira Violin and Inspira Elmer are the, are the two that I'm the director of. And there's a third Inspira hospital called Inspira Medical, uh, sorry, Molucca Hill. Um, so with that, I should say that we both have several disclosures. We are both paid consultants for Cerebell. So I think it's probably important to s give you a little description of Cooper and the Inspira Health System. I'm sure many people are uh, come from different hospital systems, uh, different descriptors. And so let me tell you a little bit about R2. So Cooper is a tertiary referral center, really the only one in South Jersey. And it says 560 beds, but don't let that fool you. It's really the main trauma center and and ICU uh, hospital, critically ill hospital in South Jersey. And despite the number of beds, the volume of critical ill patients is incredibly high. And so I found this fascinating, but 50% of our patients in the ICU come through transfers and not through the emergency room, quite different than where I trained. And the number one source of transfers is the Inspira system. And so, you know, quite a few, despite the, the number of beds in Inspira, quite a few critical ill patients come through there. Cooper's also a level one trauma center. It's also has a medical school, an MD, uh, school attached to it. And so it, it is certainly a one of the premier training centers within Jersey. And Spear, on the other hand, I call it, it's, it's a teaching community hospital. So it has critical care fellowship. It has multiple residencies. Its uh, academics are pushed the best they can. And it's, but it's still really entrenched in the community. And as such, it's still very much community-based hospital. Um, you can see between the two, about 500 beds, about the same as Cooper. Uh, one's located in Vineland, that's where I mostly practice, the second in Mullica Hill. Let me talk a little bit about what practicing was like before Cerebell. So when I think of a critically ill patient uh, who potentially is seizing, I think of kind of three components to their care. I think of the medical or the ICU physician aspect. I think of the neuro or the availability to trained neurologists to help guide the antiepileptics and treatment. And then I think about the equipment to actually diagnose the seizure. And so before and after Cerebell, the intensivists haven't changed. Our model is we have critical care fellows at both hospitals 24 hours a day, and an intensivist, always a Cooper Cooper employed intensivists there during normal business hours with availability at nighttime. Now, uh, I think we, we could have better neurology coverage than we do. So we have a neurology hospitalist. She's outstanding, but she's there really, it says nine to three, maybe nine to five Monday through Friday uh, with of course the occasional, occasional holidays and, and trips. And there's no replacement. We do have a couple community neurologists who will come every now and then on the weekend and provide some, some consultation. But for the most part, it's those regular defined business hours. That is pre-Cerebell, that's post-Cerebell. Um, I, I should say that we do have a relationship with Cooper for stroke neuro. So those tele-stroke patients that come to the ER and may need TNK, we do have access to them. But for regular consultation, it's rather limited. EEG, on the other hand, we have two standard EEGs at Vineland, I think two at Mullica Hill as well. They're available from nine to three. There's one tech, the use of it competes with the outpatient EEGs too. So if they're busy, 
both machines are in use, it would be impossible to get it done on an inpatient basis. And it's really only from nine to three, Monday through Friday. And, and this truly, you know, this, this created a problem. We did not have any access to urgent or emergent EEG. If it's Saturday and there was a concern that a patient is seizing, that we could not call in a technologist, there was no one available, it, it would just be impossible to get an EEG. And this left a, a huge hole in the care that we provided to these patients. What ended up happening? Well, as you'll see in the next slide, we ended up transferring the patients. We lost over two patients. And this was looked at the year, the calendar year 2020 before the implementation of Cerebell. We lost over two patients a month just for the need of conventional EEG or continuous EEG. And so we were left with a couple options. Number one, uh, and get more EEGs, employ more techs, costly. It's costly to get the number of techs to cover seven days a week, all of those off hours. It's costly to get the equipment. This was based on kind of standard technology st salary, was over $500,000 to do that. Didn't seem very practical. And, and if you see in the bottom, this stat, I find this absolutely fascinating. Nine to three sounds like regular business hours. That sounds like a lot. But in fact, it's very, very little in the grand scheme of, of, of things. Nine to three, that's six hours a day, five days a week, that's 30 hours total. 24 hours in a day, you do the math, that's one and a quarter day per week EEG was available. That means on an average week, 5.75 days, we would not have access to EEG. And Dr. Rincon is going to very quickly, he's going to go through how important it is to diagnose and to stop seizures quickly uh, in terms of brain health. And so this truly you know, was a major gap. And so we had to do something. 82% of the time, we didn't have EEG. And so what did we do? As it says, we transferred the patients. And this is a nice map of Southern Jersey. And you can see the bottom is, is where Inspira Medical uh, Center Vineland is. And about halfway is where Mulca Hill is. It's a little bit closer. But it would take approximately an hour, um, 45 minutes if you're, if you're in an ambulance going fast, to get from one hospital to the other. That's an important thing to recognize when you're considering considering what seizures can do um, and who pays for that transfer. You know, we'll talk some about the financials, but usually the sending facility in Spirit has its own transferring system, uh, transfer, transport system, but still uh, those ambulances on average when transferring a critically ill patient, when you have an ACLS trained nurse, when you have all the monitors, we found it was roughly $7,500 per patient to transfer. And that's not the ones being flown. A helicopter for that distance can cost upwards of 30 grand per patient. And I wish it was that simple, right? I wish you could say, I have a patient, I think they're seizing, let's transfer them to Cooper, or let's transfer them to an academic hospital, and then boom, they're there. It's not that simple. So this, this is eight plus hours to obtain a reading EEG. Let me walk you through this. This is starting at the time where the transport team is available at the sending facility. So the bed's been assigned, the accepting doctor has accepted the patient, they're waiting for them. The transport team shows up to Inspira Vineland and says, I'm here to take Mr. Jones to Cooper. So just to do so, there's a, a lot that goes into it. First off, we have to move the patient from the from one bed to the stretcher if they're on continuous medications you have to move that over if they're on the ventilator you have to switch the vents and i would say this has 30 minutes i think that's i think that's generous i've seen it take an hour or more so it, it's not a simple transfer then you actually have to drive there i showed you 45 minutes to drive there you then got to move the patient and do the whole thing in reverse another 30 minutes now this four hour time period, that is, that's taken from multiple studies, they've replicated this where they say, I'm in an academic hospital, I need an emergency EEG now. And they measured how long does it actually take to apply that EEG? The answer, about four hours. That's a long time. And then once the EEG is on, what happens? That it takes time to collect the data and have someone read and interpret that EEG. That's been shown to be three hours. So assuming you have a transport team ready to take the patient immediately, over eight hours just to get and read the EEG. Uh, that to me seems un unacceptable. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Rincon to talk a little bit about the importance of recognizing and treating seizures. 
Thanks, Adam. So uh, Dr. Green already established what are the uh, what is the framework in terms of our our practice? What was the framework uh, and the limitations administratively of uh, delivering uh, EEG continuous EEG in patients that require uh, that type of monitoring based on neurological issues and the indications? So you know there were administratively some limitations uh, operationally. Uh, Dr. Green already explained, you know, what were those operational limitations in terms of availability of EEG machines, competition of EEG machines between inpatient and outpatient populations, availability of technicians, and availability of neurologists, specialists, you know, that can actually look into this stuff, uh, you know, efficiently and readily available at the institution. So that post. Uh, an operational sort of like challenge for us in terms of how to treat our patients. So uh, having said that now, what were the clinical sort of like needs? You know, now that we have a, a, a gap in care, you know, what are the things that we were interested in and what are sort of like the monsters or like the uh, creatures that we were uh, fighting? So in, in this slide, I, I, I want to present, you know, sort of like the epidemiology of, of, of ictal pattern, seizure activity, and non-convulsive status within different cohorts. And I can actually, um, you know, sort of like, like, like think about a couple of the observational studies that are built into this slide. Uh, you know, I can quote some, you know, from Columbia, you know, Jan Klassen, Mauro Otto, you know, they did a lot of studies in terms of the prevalence of these uh, problem in critically ill populations. And since we're talking about a, a critical care base, uh, you know, sort of like practice, it's important to sort of like recognize, you know, that the prevalence is extremely high. So 92% of patients uh, that are critically ill, you know, uh, so like on average, have non-convulsive seizures or like ictal patterns. And about 20% of those, you can actually, uh, you know, see seizure activity on, on continuous EEG. But that's on continuous EEG. That's if you go in and look for it. Right. So if you have a critically ill patient in your intensive care unit that has an abnormal mental status, that has some premorbid conditions, you name it, it could be a stroke, it could be an old uh, you know, brain injury, it could be seizure uh, as, a, as part of the history, those patients have a higher risk of, of, of having these ictal patterns when they become critically ill. So those are medical patients. You can see this also in surgical patients. You can see this in traumatic brain injury patients, et cetera. So, you know, the prevalence is high but there's only one way of knowing it, right? And that is by monitoring. So, you know, the, the, the issues that we were concerned about is that we were not identifying this uh, efficiently in, 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 in our cohort. Next. So Dr. Green already mentioned uh, the, the, the time of, of intervention, you know, how fast you are, how aggressive you are at taking care of issues in neurological patients. So over the last 30 years, the decade of the brain started in 1990, we have developed interventions, you know, for many type uh, many types of brain injury. So for stroke, we have recanalization, we have intravenous thrombolysis, we have mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, for traumatic brain injury, we have, you know, pre-hospital systems that can bring patients in uh, aggressively so that we can institute therapies, you know, surgical interventions, you know, uh, that sort of thing. For status epilepticus for patients with seizures, seizure activity, we have also developed, you know, um, therapies and algorithms that help us deliver interventions aggressively and on a timely fashion. And those interventions are also time dependent, just such as stroke. So um, when you look at the epidemiology of this, this is an old study, you know, sort of like epidemiological stuff that looked at the responsiveness of a patient to uh, an anti-epileptic. We will see that time is the most important variable. You know, the more time that you delay the intervention, then the more refractory the patient becomes to to, to, to further intervention. So, um, you know, if you start with one anti-epileptic, it becomes really hard for that anti-epileptic and then a second anti-epileptic and then a third anti-epileptic to kick in if you have delayed treatment for uh, several minutes or, or hours. So, you know, in, in terms of seizures, you know, we are, we're in the same sort of like mode as an ischemic stroke. We have to deliver these interventions um, very uh, quickly. So, the mortality and the outcomes also time dependent. You know, the more aggressive you are, the more efficient that you are, the more rapid that you deliver these interventions, then you see uh, 
uh, a significant impact in terms of morbidity and mortality in the long term. Now, it doesn't stop there, you know, because of what I've said, because of all of these observational studies, there's some clinical trials out there that you remember, you know, uh, you know, Versa, you know, for pre-hospital uh, seizure activity, you know, was one of the landmark trials a couple of years ago. These professional societies have endorsed monitoring and the delivery of these interventions in a timely fashion. So the American Heart Association, for example, uh, endorses the use of uh, some the, so, so, some modality of 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 of, of continuous EEG monitoring, you know, uh, in patients with post cardiac arrest, for example. The Neurocritical Care Society has already endorsed uh, rapidity of interventions and monitoring within five. Um, to uh, six, well, sorry, with the 15 to 60 minutes for uh, patients with status epilepticus. And then finally, um, the Jake Commission has also endorsed the, uh, the societies, right, that have already um, sort of like supported this notion of aggressive and timely interventions. So now that we know uh, what, what are the gaps in care, what are the sinister conditions, you know, that we're dealing with, the epidemiology, sort of like in a nutshell, the high prevalence of these uh, uh, conditions and that there are interventions that can actually, one, diagnose and to treat uh, those conditions. Then what is out there to fill in those gaps, the gaps in care, the gaps in the operation and the gaps in um, administratively, right, to take care uh, of our patients in an efficient uh, fashion. Next slide. Please. So I call this point of care EEG. Some people call it critical care EEG. You know, the company calls it a different way, right? But in reality, you know, this is, in, in, in my opinion, EEG at the bedside. You know, you can deploy this within five minutes. Operationally, it doesn't take uh, a brain surgeon to do this. You know, you can train the nurses, you can train house staff, you can train uh, residents and fellows uh, to deploy this. The technology has already been uh, tested and, and, and validated. It's very simple to use. And it has three main components that I want to highlight. One is a disposable uh, headband that has uh, 10 uh, electrodes or, 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 or 10, um, yeah, let's call it electrodes, that uh, provide eight channels of EEG monitoring for, for each hemisphere. And it's disposable, right? And you can use it uh, in, in, in a patient, you know, for more than two hours. And it has some gel that you can actually uh, use. And uh, the training actually teaches you how to use the, uh, the, the machine to look at the impedance, et cetera. It's very easy to use. The second component is that sort of like um, uh, device, you know, it's, it's portable, it's lightweight. You can uh, put it at the head of the patient, right? And it provides you with a small screen where you can actually look at continuous EEG uh, waveforms. So if you have some idea of how to interpret EEG, you can actually use the machine at the bedside to sort of like guide, you know, uh, uh, what sort of like um, uh, EEG activity the patient is having, is the patient responding to therapies, et cetera. But one of the most uh, sort of like valuable uh, uh, things, you know, that this technology has, right, is an AI, an artificial intelligence engine that actually transforms the way that you um, look at continuous EEG in general. Because what Adam said at the beginning, right, you need a tech, you need a specialist, right, to read this stuff. The artificial intelligence component of this changes that uh, paradigm. Basically, the machine will interpret a burden of seizure activity, that, you know, and, and according to the technology, and then can tell you, right, how much seizure activity the patient may be having uh, at that specific point in time. So not only, right, you can look at EEG, now you have a validated artificial intelligence engine that can tell you, you know, the burden of seizure activity. So you no longer need a specialist or a tech to tell you the patient is seizing. The machine is actually telling you, uh, uh, you know, if, if the patient has seizure activity. And then finally, the third component, right? Uh, if you are a neurologist, if you know how to interpret EEGs, is that sort of like cloud-based EEG portal that you can actually look um, not only, you know, within the institution, but also remotely. So those are the advantages of this uh, newer technology, this uh, uh, point of care EEG, um, you know, that actually transform and has changed the way that we looked at this, uh, uh, you know, at least in our practice. Next slide.
I'm going to talk about a couple cases, but first I, I wanted to highlight, you know, the, the term point of care. And I think it's just so fascinating. In, in a world of medicine where we say less is more, uh, you know, we're transfusing less. There's so many examples of where we're providing less care than what the initial, what we used to do. Uh, I think about point of care and the, and, and it's, it's less people involved. And the example I think of first is point of care ultrasound taken over the emergency room, taken over critical care world, entering the hospital medicine scene. What does point of care mean to me? What that means is the person who has decided to order the test actually does the test, interprets the results of the test, and then changes therapy based on that. And that's what we're doing here, right? I think of a radiology. So you need an x-ray. I order it. A different person comes and does it. A radiology, radiologist interprets it. I read what the radiologist says. Then I decide to do something. That takes a lot of time. When you talk about point of care, or in this case, EEG, I decide I want an EEG. I put it on the patient. I get the result and I act immediately. And then I see, I can see that that seizure burden is improved. That's amazing to me. And I, and I think that we're going to see more and more of this uh, throughout the care of patients. So we've used Cerebell in the Inspira system, last I checked, um, over 150 times. And I think it may be more than that now. And so I picked two cases that I wanted to highlight. Clearly, there are many, many others that were useful. The first here is an 80-year-old female. She was first admitted to the hospital with symptomatic bradycardia, long sinus pauses, um, in the set, uh, setting of using a beta blocker. And she was brought to our ICU. Um, we were letting the beta blocker wash out. And she developed and had witnessed tonic-clonic seizures and was, was encephalopathic in a post ictal state in the ICU after. And the question is, you know, is she in non-convulsive status? Or, or is she just post-ictal? Without EEG, I think it's going to be very challenging to, to answer that question. And of course, as all bad things happen do, that happened at two in the morning, you can see in the middle there. And so at two in the morning, my fellow is sitting there calling us saying, what do I do? And what, what we used to do, we wouldn't have much choice, either watch or try to transfer to a facility that can do an EEG. And in this scenario, we had Cerebell, we were able to apply the point of care EEG. It showed a 50% seizure burden. Uh, we were loaded her with Keppra, we gave her Ativan, the seizure burden resolved down to 0%, her mentation improved, and it says discharged home, eventually discharged home, not the next day. And uh, she went on, went on to being discharged. And so without Cerebell, it's, it would have really been uncertain whether that seizure persisted. Was she still in non-convulsive status or not? It would have been uncertain if we gave medication, what would, if it worked, if, you know, maybe she never was seizing, if we did an EG the next day. Um, it would have resulted in immediate transfer. And as I said, that would have ended up in a long delay until actually getting an EEG and confirming seizure activity. With Cerebell, we were able to quickly diagnose, treat, and focus on the primary condition with a, with a positive outcome, of course. Another example, of course, you see this is at 9 p.m., another time when EEG was unavailable. 84-year-old came in with a colectomy. She was admitted to general medical floor, doing well, and then had a hypoxic-mediated cardiac arrest. I, I believe it was due to aspiration. Uh, CPR was performed. We had return of uh, spontaneous circulation, and she was still in a coma state with this kind of rhythmic lip twitching, um, of course, intubated by this point, was brought to our cardiac ICU to undergo temperature target management. She was given Ativan to the lip twitching. Um, it improved the twitching, but still unsure what was happening. We applied Cerebell and within minutes, uh, within minutes of her getting to the ICU and being stabilized. And, you know, the question is how, how long, how quickly can we do it? Um, I, I think it really depends on how much uh, other medical complexities occurring. The patient is stable. As soon as we move them to the ICU, we can have the cerebral machine on and interpreting uh, within minutes. Um, obviously, if procedures need to be done, there may be a delay. Um, cerebral in this case showed 0% seizure burden. The next day we did a conventional EEG and it confirmed it. She completed temperature target management and luckily uh, her mentation improved and she was extubated and discharged home. Um, and I think this to me is one of the most valuable aspects of Cerebell. It's, it's to rule out seizure. I find that so incredibly important in this population. No one, we, 
in Spira and when we're in the community center, our goal is not to become a large neurology, neurocritical care hospital. I want to identify patients who need advanced neurocritical care services, and I want to send them to Dr. Rincon and Cooper to take care of them. What I don't want to do is send patients who maybe they have anoxic and myoclonic jerks. I don't want to send those patients that don't need the care that I'm capable of caring for at Inspira. And that's so important is that we're trying to avoid unnecessary transfers. I'm not trying to avoid all transfers, just unnecessary transfers. So in this case, we were able to, to figure out that this was unlikely to be seizure. We were able to keep the patient. We didn't have to escalate medications to try to stop the twitching. We didn't have to transfer the patient and we were able to discharge home quicker. I, you can imagine sending them to Cooper and, and the, the number of days and time it would take to just uh, to stabilize the patient further. I think the length of stay would have been longer. And so to me, this is the true value of, of point of care ultrasound or point of care EEG. Thank you, Adam. So uh, one general of the U.S. Army once said, one of the worst things in the battlefield is not to know what you're dealing with. And I totally agree with that. So now that we know, you know, what is the issue that we're dealing with and that we are re really in, 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 in a battlefield against, you know, seizures and, and, and non-convulsive seizures, and we know that we need to intervene aggressively, what did we do now that we know what the gaps are in terms of uh, the, the operation, you know, how can we satisfy, uh, you know, uh, uh, patient care with this uh, newer technology? Can we incorporate the technology in our practice? And the answer is yes. So this was actually our uh, proposal, right, uh, to deal with this issue, right, to deal with the uncertainty. And when you're dealing with uncertainty for patients, right, that's pretty bad. You know, you, you, you don't know what you're doing. That's really bad for the patient. So we sat down as a group, multidisciplinary group. There were critical care doctors. There were um, neurologists. Uh, there were uh, epileptologists. There were uh, epilepsy techs. There were house staff, fellows, residents, and nursing staff. And we incorporated all these people, all these leaders, you know, from these different specialties. And we said, you know, we have this proposal. And by the way, this is our experience, right? This is not, you know, based on anything. This is what we decided to do based on, um, you know, some reports from in, in, in the literature and what people had done. But we decided to approach the problem in this fashion. And when you looked at um, the, the center of the slide, you will see that we relied on the technology, on the artificial intelligence part of it. And we decided that uh, a burden of 70% in seizure activity given by Cerebell would initiate all of this cascade uh, of, of events, right? We were not relying on uh, epileptologists in the middle of the night, you know, for those, you know, examples of, for example, uh, uh, Dr. Green uh, showed up, uh, you know, before. No, we relied on the AI and then somebody at the bedside will uh, initiate all of these uh, events. Some of the recommendations here are based on guidelines in terms of the antipileptic dosing, you know, what sort of like agent to use, um, you know, what the follow-up would be. And the uh, clinician at the bedside would, would decide, right, if the patient needed an airway or not, intubate the patient, start uh, further sedation, and initiate transfer if that's what the patient needed. And then um, based on different burdens, then, you know, we decided to keep the patient in uh, the institution, but we actually only initiated transfer when people really require um, uh, interventions. Next slide. Yeah, great, Fred. I, and I, Dr. Cohn, I just want to point yes. out two, two things, too, if you don't mind. That, right. that I, the first is I find, I find it fascinating that, uh, you know, if we, we would maybe say greater than 70%, we'll just call that status epilepticus. And if you look at, at the bottom where it says go to step number two, I find it so powerful that the default wasn't high seizure burden send to another center. The default was high seizure burden, try to treat, if unable to treat, transfer. And I think that that's a powerful thing that, uh, that using this technology, we were in fact able to, to treat a handful of patients uh, and keep them, keep them in Inspira. Um, no, Adam, thank you very much for highlighting that. Yes, that, that was a, 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 another important thing about the, uh, uh, the in institution of Cerebral is that we were actually treating patients on the basis of the reading. And if we were just not able to do it, yeah. we'll just transfer the patient. That's absolutely right. So 
to give a little academic uh, approach to this, we decided to collect data prospectively on what we were doing. So we were actually approved by an IRB to collect data prospectively. Uh, we uh, identified 88 patients within almost a year. Uh, we instituted this um, in 2021. And uh, we use uh, Cerebell primarily in the intensive care unit, but we identify also patients in uh, the emergency department. And we were able to deploy this technology, right, uh, within two hours. So that's actually better than any academic center that does continue CEG in the United States. I can tell you that from uh, literature uh, reports. So um, in order to compare what we were doing, you know, how many transfers, what the impact in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the economic cost of this, uh, we selected a uh, historic cohort. Uh, from the year before, and then we compared the, one, the patients that require continuous EEG, and then we transferred, and then we looked at that data. And then our endpoints uh, were very simple, sort of like uh, what diagnosis were involved in the process, what was the indication for continuous EEG, and then finally, what were the health uh, care uh, related costs. Next. Most of our patients were actually undifferentiated altered mental status, people that were just comatose stupors and nobody really knew why, or you know, they had history of uh, epilepsy in the past, uh, they had some sort of brain injury and had history of seizures in the past. And then finally, uh, at least a, a fifth of our patients were post-cardiac arrest uh, patients in the intensive care unit. Next slide. So this is perhaps you know, one, the best part of, of, of our experience is that we were able to rule in at least 22% of the time patients that had some atrial activity. 6% of patients had real non-convulsive status. They were airlifted and transferred or you just couldn't like treat them. And then remaining status, they were airlifted and, 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 and sent to our... Um, uh, our, our main hospital, which is uh, uh, Cooper in Camden. 16% uh, had also significant seizure activity that somehow uh, either responded to uh, some initial interventions. And then finally, right, almost 80% of our cohort, right, we ruled out any seizure activity. Now, so remember what I said in terms of uncertainty. When you are dealing with this and you are not monitoring, you are dealing with a lot of uncertainty, you may expose patients to unnecessary treatments. And not doing that in at least 80% of your patient population, right, that can translate significantly into a lot of benefits, as I will summarize uh, in, in the next slide. Next slide. So 78%, you know, um, you know, more than two thirds of the cohort, we uh, excluded uh, you know, a seizure activity, non-convulsive status. We didn't treat unnecessarily. These patients did not transfer. There are some unquantified benefits with this, you know, patient satisfaction, uh, family of the patient satisfaction, uh, you know, nursing staff satisfaction. You just cannot quantify uh, these benefits, but they're inherent. They're there. Um, these patients were not treated blindly. We were able to determine that they did not require any aggressive uh anti-epileptic or anesthetic or anything, uh, you know, that require uh, drips or intuition and did, did not go through our seizure pathway. Sort of like a classic seizure pathway, right? You, you load them and then you get a second agent. And then if, if, if you think that they're still seizing, you just put them on propofol and then you wait till the next day till the uh, epileptologist comes in to rule out. Next slide. So this is what I mentioned, you know, the potential sort of like uh, benefits uh, out there that could be quantified and some potential benefits that could not uh, uh, be quantified. I mentioned this before, it changed the way that we look at continuous EEG. You know, when, you, when you're thinking about continuous EEG, you may have a selection bias, right? You may be sort of like, uh, you know, thinking, you know, uh, in, in a different way, having point of care EEG available to you, right? Um, you know, can give you very good information, important information about what the patient, um, you know, is having at that point, at that point in time. So eliminating the uncertainty, in my opinion, is one of the 
you know, most significant benefits of, of point of care EEG. The faster that the technology gets deployed, the faster the uh, treatments uh, are available for the patient if they rule in for seizures or non-convulsive status, right? And because, right, they are getting better, then the recovery may be better. And conversely, if you are not over-treating, right, those patients also would benefit from it, less sedation, less exposure to the possibility of a tracheostomy, the possibility of ventilator pneumonia, complications of being sedated in the intensive care unit, uh, et cetera. So they would have a faster disposition in terms of the ones that have status, well, they go into uh, the treatment pathway and if you cannot do anything, then to uh, the mothership. And then the ones that you're not treating, faster disposition as well. You know, you win them faster, you know, you know they, they get out of the intensive care unit faster, et cetera. So, you know, we can identify uh, seizure and ictal patterns with this technology, and that aligns, as I mentioned before, with professional society endorsements, with best, best practice um, uh, uh, in, in general, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and this best practice guidance have been endorsed by professional societies such as the Neurocritical Care Society and the American Heart Association. Next slide. Perfect. Thanks. Back Thanks, back. Dr. Rincon. So, yeah, so I, I hope it, up to this point we've kind of laid out the problem. We've talked about our solution to it, and now it's time to show what the results are. So I'm going to go through just a couple slides about kind of the clinical results and the financial implications after the implementation of Cerebell. So the first is we, we found that we reduced 100% of unnecessary seizure transfer. So what does that mean? Pre-Cerebell, we were averaging about 2.1 transfers a month from, from Inspira to Cooper for the need of conventional or continuous EEG. So that was 2.1 transfers per month. After we applied it, those number of transfers dropped down to 0.9 transfers a month. Um, I think that's pretty impressive. I think more than 11 patients a year weren't transferred that would have been transferred. Now, I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but I... Uh, I think it's impactful. And I think not only clinically it matters for some of those intangible reasons, Dr. Rincon said, but also financially. So I mentioned earlier the cost, the cost of transferring, just the transfer cost alone is on average $7,500 per patient. This is billed to the sending hospital. Um, that's based on data from Inspires Transport company. Now, we, what we did in terms of increased revenue is we looked first at our the cohort, the historical cohort, and we looked at how much money Inspira collected, not charged, but collected for those patients, right? And, and on average, the group that was transferred in the historic cohort, they collected 4, 000, about $4,000. Now, of course, whenever you have a patient that's transferred, they split the DRG between the, set, the two hospitals based on the amount of time spent at the hospitals. So you can see about 4,000 was still collected for stabilization of those patients. Um, now, when we looked at the Cerebell cohort, the, the patients that Cerebell was applied to, so this is all 88 patients, there was on average, they collected to over a little over about $10,500. And so the average incremental revenue increased per patient was about $6,500, or you can see the combined of maybe 13,000 or so, um, or 14,000 or so. And we were able to, based on the startup costs and maintenance costs of the technology, calculate how many patients would we have to avoid transfer per year in order to make it financially feasible and break even. And our number for our institution was about eight and a half patients. So if eight and a half patients annually avoided transfer, and this isn't a system that uses Cerebell almost a hundred times, I think almost a hundred times a year, eight and a half patients avoided transfer, we would break even. Um, I think that's pretty impressive. And uh, just looking at our numbers, we, uh, we avoided at least 12 or 11 patients. So we were able to demonstrate that not only does it provide better care, significantly better care, but it, uh, it also is financially viable. And I think this slide, you know, it's probably one of the most important slides. And, and every time I look at it, I think about it, I present it a little bit different because there's just so much here. There, the, the diagnostic confidence when you have available this technology 
um, is I can't that is so impactful. You know, having a patient who's encephalopathic or post seizure, and you're not sure if they're still seizing, and even just giving the medications or proceeding with intubation, and there's still this question, and having the ability to definitively rule out seizure uh, makes things, it's just as a clinician who's standing at the bedside, significantly easier. And so, you know, there's always a scenario where you see a patient, you're concerned, you give them Keppra, you wait till the next morning, you get the EEG and it says no seizure. And you sit there and you wonder, are they not seizing because they never were and I gave them an unnecessary med? Or are they not seizing because the med I gave them actually did the job? And what do we do? We discharge them on Keppra. How long do they stay on Keppra? Probably forever. <laughs> so, so this ability is, uh, is, is incredibly important. And of course, better care always leads to reduced length of stay. And, and this final point, reduced COVID exposure, now, thankfully, is less of an issue. But at the time, it takes, I'm not an EEG tech, 15, 20 minutes to properly apply an EEG. The tech generally stands in the room and waits. A lot of these patients had COVID. And by doing Cerebell, quickly applying, standing outside the room, watching the seizure burden from the from the window really decrease the amount of COVID exposure to the technologist. And also those patients that were transferred decreased COVID exposure the entire transport path. And the last thing I'd say is Dr. Rincon mentioned uh, closer to the family. You know, I was highlighting how Inspira is a community hospital. These are these are patients who's had the same cardiologist, the same family medicine doc for 20, 30 years, these doctors come to the hospital and see them and removing them from the, from the, that hospital and the caregivers or the physicians who know them the best, hmm. um, is, is damaging. And, and not only that, a lot of our patients, families, um, they couldn't afford the trip to Cooper. They couldn't go and see their family members. And so keeping them at their home hospital where they could get care from the peep, from the physicians who knew them with their families around them, uh, it, it's can't be quantified. So, you know, what we found was that transferring for EEG diagnostics is not optimal patient care, that, and nor is it financially beneficial. Point of care EEG enabled us to rapidly rule in or rule out seizures at the bedside by anyone um, in less than five minutes. And I think by implementing this technology, we're able to raise the standard of care, and we did it uh, at a lower cost and was, a, and was able to maintain it. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Green, and thank you, Dr. Rincon. Let's open it up for some questions. So for those centers where maybe they're not transferring patients today or they don't have to transfer out of network, so maybe they are not incurring the same losses that, that you guys described, um, was this the primary driver of you implementing Cerebell, the, the financials of, of reducing transfers? Uh, no, not at all. The, the primary driver was patient care. We wanted to provide the best uh, care to our patients. The, uh, the, the healthcare costs and that sort of thing uh, were, were, were secondary. We wanted to uh, you know, give the best therapy to our patients based on those guidelines, based on those endorsements from uh, professional societies. That, it, that should be the bottom line of any uh, quality improvement project, by the way. Thank you. And I think in that same vein, perhaps, uh, you talked about at the beginning, it takes roughly eight hours to get an EEG, even at the receiving hospitals. So what were you guys doing to address that length of time for an EEG at Cooper? So I think that's, I think it's fascinating in that uh, when the study started, um, calling in the tech and probably waiting, but uh, very quickly, Cooper itself adapted uh, Cerebell. And so we have Cerebell there as well. And so I, uh, I think uh, it, I think it's going to be interesting as this technology becomes more and more available, if it's going to be used as a, a rapid rule out and if positive call in conventional EEG in the future, or if, uh, if, you know, calling the tech is still going to remain the standard, but we use Cerebell at Cooper for those scenarios. And Adam, and the other thing is what you mentioned, right? In terms of our algorithm, our protocol, the one that we define by consensus is that we were treating those patients before they arrived to Cooper. So, so we knew that when we accepted the patient, some sort of intervention was already in place uh, for those patients. So, but Adam is uh, right. We also use cerebral at Cooper. Thank you. And maybe I think it's worth going into a little bit more when you talked about the, the presentation of those patients that are at risk for seizures 
you mentioned the undifferentiated AMS was was probably your highest uh, highest frequency for applying Cerebel. Uh, I think a lot of the the listeners today they've seen this patient, but from your perspective, what what would be those characteristics, those main characteristics that would trigger your uh, perception as a risk for non-convulsive seizures? Yeah, so in the in the field of emergency neurology, right, you have to exclude life-threatening conditions up front, right? You have a couple of minutes to do it. And the CAT scan is part of it, you know. Uh, somebody comes in with, in a coma, a stupor, stayed down, you know, EMS reports some stuff. Uh, you have to make sure they don't have a hemorrhage, that they are not having a stroke. And then you have to go down the uh, differential diagnosis, your list in terms of uh, eliminated stuff. But there are patients that may have some history that puts them at higher risk being in a coma of having ictal or seizure activity. So the one that has a history of epilepsy, you know, people that have been exposed to, um, you know, trauma or, or some degree of brain injury, people that are born, uh, you know, with, uh, with, with epilepsy. And for some reason, you know, uh, uh, there is some report uh, somewhere that they are an anti-epileptic. Uh, patients that are in a coma with brain injury, all right? So somebody comes in with a hemorrhage, right? And, uh, or a traumatic brain injury uh, that is fresh. You know, that also should raise your suspicion. Somebody where you suspect an infection, somebody in an, uh, you know, a stupor or comatose state with fever, nuchal rigidity, right? All of those um, uh, increase your pre-test, your pre-test probability of having seizures. And what the technology enables you to do is for those patients with a high pre-test probability, it, because, because it's highly sensitive right, and, 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 and accurate, um, you know, uh, to rule in, you know, people that may be in active uh, uh, convulsive status or may have non-convulsive seizures. Thank you. And I'll probably make this the last question in respect for everyone's time. When you talk about reducing unnecessary medications and intubations, I think we all kind of intuitively know, but if it'd be worth describing, what are the downstream ramifications of not having to intubate those patients or administer prop propofol and Keppra? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a question that it's always it's always challenging to fully answer, right? Um, and, and I think Dr. McCone mentioned some of the answers, things such as every time you put someone on the ventilator, you may not get them off, especially if they have pre-existing lung disease. So there's the risk of having to discuss tracheostomy. And of course, that alone carries an incredible amount of burden in terms of disposition once you have tracheostomy, the complications from prolonged mechanical ventilation, uh, ventilator associated pneumonia, um, just really the uh, dysphagia and inability to, to take in the same PO, uh, the quality of life of the patient. I think you go on and on about you're, you're taking a patient who's potentially not seizing and making it potentially to the point where they're uh, dependent on the medical system for, for extended period of time. So I, I, I would always, we've talked about this and I would, I would love the ability to actually quantify, to say how much meds were reduced because we were able to diagnose quickly. Uh, that just sounds like a study that would be very challenging, challenging to create. But, um, uh, but I, think it, uh, I think it would be significant.